Good afternoon, everybody. We are back. The Atheist Experience is live. It is Sunday, July 28th. Yeah, I think yeah so. that's right. So, okay. oh boy, it flies by. And uh, here we are. The uh, show is sponsored, as always, by Atheist Community of Austin, a nonprofit educational organization promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. I'm Martin. That's Ashley. Um, let's see. What are our announcements? Uh, ACA has weekly meetings every Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. at Hot Jumbo Bagels. That's downtown, 307 West 5th Street, between Guadalupe and Lavaca, except for the first Sunday of each month, when we have our lecture series in the Longhorn Room of First Cafeteria in North Cross Mall. Our next lecture series will be this coming Sunday. Yes. Interesting. Our lecturer will be a fellow named Jason Crudeur, who uh, is affiliated in some degree with uh, NLP, which is Neuro -linguist Linguistic Programming. Yes. Uh, which um, this could be interesting because um, yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. This uh, one of our members <laughs> um, is is, uh, is, is kind of into this, and so he wanted to have the guy come and give his presentation. Um, and ironically, he's the one that just left last just, week. Just moved. So, <laughs> he moved away last um, week. So it depends. This Mr. Kudur may or may not have any uh, boosters there because there is. There does seem to be uh, NLP seems to be one of these things that disturbingly skirts the. Yeah. borderland between uh, actual psychology and pseudoscience because yeah. like, there's a uh, there's an extensive write-up on it on quackwatch.com which yeah. is this uh, medical pseudoscience yeah, type thing. thing and then there's another lengthy write-up about it on the skeptic uh, skeptics dictionary website at skeptic.com okay. where it also talks about how um, you know there's a lot of its uh, conclusions may not uh, have a, a sound basis yeah um, but we'll see we'll see what this has to say and um, and if it uh, it could generate some interesting discussion yeah and uh, Jeff made uh, a good point that if it is not on the up and up it could get we'll, very interesting can, I mean we, we'll let the guy know. I mean we're not there to we, we don't well <laughs> we have before, <laughs> yes, uh, there's we have a, before. interesting uh, <laughs> but this could but, but this will probably not be uh, anything like uh, the, the actual minister yeah I can't believe it's gonna be quite that bad chaplain so. who actually came and yeah, started um, preaching right so that was bizarre <laughs> um, but this could be interesting uh, I expect there to be some fascinating debate going on and we'll re get to the bottom of what this all is yeah so uh, <laughs> There's never a dull moment at ACA, I tell ya. Uh, reruns of this program uh, are played Tuesday afternoons at 4.30 here on this channel. Um, we're not exactly sure, I and mean, we, we can't tell you precisely what episodes you're going to get. Usually they run a week behind, or what have you. Um, let's see, Godless Gamers meets every Monday night, 7 o'clock p.m. at the home of Russell and Virginia Glasser. <clears throat> and for information on that, please check our uh, website. Uh, Atheist Happy Hour is a Thursday evening. Uh, we'll get together at Antonio's Tex-Mex near the intersection of I-35 and Highway 183. Uh, good times, good talk, good food. Um, the Nonprofits is ACA's internet radio program. That's weekly. Saturday afternoons at 2 at the AtheistNetwork.com website. Your web browser will need the Real Player plugin in order to hear the audio stream, and there is a, a live ch interactive chat room that goes on concurrently with the show where you can interact with the show that way. Um, uh, the show has been very, very popular. And um, just another thing that makes ACA one of the more active regional atheist groups yeah. in the country. We, know if we have a reputation for that. We, I think we, this is the only live call-in atheist what I've heard. TV show in America. Of yeah, its it's time. the only show of its format. Yeah, like, there are a lot of pre-recorded shows. Like, there are a lot of pre-recorded shows. I mean, American atheists make shows that, that, yes. that, that are pre-recorded, yeah. then they send them out to Philly Green, and then you can play them as yeah. tapes on access channels and stuff like that. I think we do the only show of its kind, and yeah. uh, hopefully we can... Uh, pretty although, amazing, but... David Clark, who is a former co-host of this program, yes. who was co-host back in the spring, and then he left for the East Coast, and you told me he's back in town today. Uh, yes, I don't know exactly so when he came you. in, but he came he in this morning. There's no public access TV work. No, he's well. He no. he's okay. uh, apparently there's no public access TV where he's moved, okay. uh, which is a shame because one of his plans was that he was going to do uh, atheist experience yeah. east out there. And, and I he guess said, from what I'm talking to him this morning, there's no atheist group in the area or anything like that. Uh -huh. And I asked him about starting up, but he is going off to do something on the job for a couple months, uh -huh. and so it's just a really bad time to start things up right now. When yeah, well, he's got to get settled out so there and do a, do exactly, thing yeah. first. But uh, so, but. I think he plans on starting one, you know, when, when things settle as down. As I understand, so uh, this should be interesting. Um, the Godless Americans March on Washington is a, a big thing happening November the 2nd of this year. That's a Saturday. Big thing in D.C. This uh, is being spearheaded by American atheists, uh, a little national group of, of which our group is not affiliated uh, formally. 
Uh, but uh, this looks like it could be a, a nice little uh, uh, event um, in the interests of you know, we're raising the profile, as it were, of godless Americans, and we're encouraging uh, uh, more and more people are sniffing at the idea of really going, making a vacation of this. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. And it should be fun. And, you know, the more taunts the thing gets from the religious right, the Hopefully, better. Hopefully, yeah. The better. Yeah. Because Pat Robertson has already, on the 700 Club, made, made a couple of snide comments about yeah. the march on godless Americans, march on Washington. And I think it's wonderful, because the more snide <laughs> comments he makes, I think the more he will galvanize and offend atheists to me. Yeah. Oh, all right, well, we'll show you. We'll get out there and do it. Yeah. Which is wonderful. I love, the, I love members of the Christian right promoting atheist events. Thank you, guys. <laughs> that's, I mean, because uh, you have infinitely more viewers than we do. So uh, that's a much better way to get the word out. Thank you very much. So that's happening. On November 2nd, and you may get uh, some more information and updates on uh, that, including like uh, accommodations and travel uh, info on godlessamericans.org, that webpage. Secularmemorials.org is another um, uh, website that is encouraging uh, atheists and uh, other uh, non-religious, non-theistic groups around the nation to make sure that uh, public, and the keyword here is public, secular, uh, memorial gatherings commemorating September 11th uh, take place on the September 11th of this year. Yeah. We know that there are going to be a whole lot of oh, formal yeah. gatherings and very public events. And it seems that it's uh, a pretty safe bet that a lot of the, uh, the high-profile oh, yeah. ones will be very religious in nature. And um, so we want to make sure that... Uh, I'm sure that the ACA is yeah, going we'll most some, likely have something. Is going to schedule something here in town, and as we get closer to the date and finalize those plans, we'll we will of course let you know. Which, surprisingly, isn't that far off. No, it's not at all. Yeah. So you get get to get on the stick with that. So um, I think that takes care of it for announcements, except to say, um, well, no, we got a couple more. Um, uh, for more information on our group, you can visit our lovely webpage at atheist-community.org or call our voicemail at 3712911. And speaking of voicemail, we've had a guy who has, a gentleman, an older gentleman, who has kept, uh, Michelle Gadouche, who's our uh, co-chair, <coughs> who's done a brilliant job now for a couple terms, has told me that there has been a guy, an, an older gentleman, who is an atheist apparently, and he is, has been attempting and for some reason not succeeding either in calling this program or calling our voicemail or something. I don't know why it is he hasn't, we haven't actually managed to speak to the man himself. Uh, some, some weird communications chain has broken down there, but his question is about atheist funeral because he is he's wanting to make his final plans. Well, I, I believe, and maybe you can correct me on this, he wasn't actually atheist, he was handling it for somebody else. Handling, his, okay. So he actually So we're not hearing done. from the older guy, we're hearing from the fellow who is trying to help him. Exactly, what, I believe so. Whatever. Uh, so. If either of you are watching today, please call the show. We'll make damn sure you get on the air. Uh, but we may answer your question right now. Um, for, for atheists who want to make sure that you have non-religious funeral arrangements uh, made available to you, uh, there's an organization the, uh, um, that's it's not a profit organization. It's understand the Austin Memorial and Burial Information Society. And there's their phone number. And this is uh, just a place where you can get forms to fill out such as, uh, there's one uh, titled, the Appointment of Agent to Control the Disposition of Remains. Uh, there's also another form, Final Arrangements Plan. Um, this is a place where you can get the necessary paperwork uh, to ensure that you have, okay, the yeah. fellow is the guy in charge of his friend's funeral arrangements. Okay, well then this is, this is uh, the, a number that you can call where you can make sure you get the paperwork to take care of, make sure yeah. that you have a godless funeral uh, if that's what the gentleman wants. Um, also, it's worth no noting that funeral homes themselves can have, you know, memorial services, yeah. right, in, on the premises that don't have to be religious in nature. They, yes. they can be perfectly secular. But that's the phone number to call. It is 480-0555. And if you want to talk to them about uh, forms uh, to fill out. Uh, so that's the information I've got there. Hopefully that helps. And apparently there's also a book. Yes. The title of the book is Funerals Without God. Don't know the author of the book, but that's a pretty simple title to remember, and you uh, can consult that. Uh, and unfortunately, Michelle said that we had a copy in our library, and I looked for it this morning, but I it's couldn't grown, find it. So <coughs> it's grown I don't know if it's buried in the back somewhere or something like that. Or, but yeah. Oh well. Or it's been one of the many books that's been borrowed and is still sitting on someone's shelf Possibly after it's two a years. Coffee like table, yeah. I'm guilty of that, unfortunately. <laughs> Fair. I've got a couple I need to get back there. Okay. Um, that would appear to be that's announcements for me. Um, right. 
let's have some news, shall we? What's in the uh, okay. in the world? Light on the news day today. Uh, really, just one main story to go over, mm -hmm. but it's a main one. Yeah, I've I've one after that, but it's sh much shorter. Okay, all so right. We'll uh, Godfrey Way's appeal of monument ruling. Appeals courts say Sumam Faith can erect display. Hmm. Uh, this is in Ogden, which uh, I don't see Utah. exactly. Ogden, Utah? Ogden, Utah. That's yeah. right, that's right. Deep in Mormon territory. Yes. Mayor Matthew Godfrey may appeal a ruling to the U.S. Supreme Court that would allow another religion to put its doctrine next to a Ten Commandments monument in the Ogden Municipal Gardens. Mm -hmm. Uh, an, appeals, an appeals court said Friday that Ogden could not display the religious statements of one organization while denying another group the right to display its, dis its statements in the same location. Exactly. They can't. <laughs> that's, that's the thing in a nutshell. Fairly obvious. You know. Uh, the five-foot-tall granite monument of the Ten Commandments was given to the city in 1966 by the Fraternal Order of Eagles. I, I always love that name. Yeah, we like to point out the acronym. <laughs> yeah, foe. <laughs> foe. The our foe. Our, the foe is putting up uh, yeah. Ten Commandments monuments. <laughs> Presuming that the monument was religious in nature, the Salt Lake City-based uh, ecum ecumenical? Ecumenical. Ecumenical yes, group. Multiple faiths. Organization. Yeah. Uh, had asked the city if it could display a similar monument outlining the seven aphorisms of its religion. Ogden denied the request, and the Sumam faith subsequently sued the city on First Amendment grounds. <laughs> because the area has six other monuments, four to pioneer settlers, one recognizing slain lawmen, and another honoring Ogden's sister city, hmm. Van Wagner, uh, who is uh, Rick Van Wagner, an attorney who argued on behalf, on the city's behalf. Okay. Um, Van, Van Wagner claim the religious nature is neutralized and that the Ten Commandments are really an artifact of an ancient and bygone era. Well, you I, know, I will, that, is, that is so disturbing. So is the Code of Hammurabi, and, you know, but we don't have white, <laughs> we don't, we're not fighting to get that up in front of yeah. government buildings and capital buildings and, and, and public land, so... Yeah. There are a lot of things out there this of is what an is artifact of an ancient and bygone era, and we don't post them on public buildings. Well, Why do we need this well, one? Well, it's just so weird that, of course it's religious, right? Of course it of course has it religious is. significance. That's the only reason they want it up there. And it is so bizarre that when it gets challenged, they immediately fly to this weird defense of, oh, yeah. well, it doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. It's just a historical document. Yeah. So it's just there for historical reasons, but it's not really a religious document. So all the Bibles that are so in churches right now are just an artifact of an ancient and bygone era. Yeah, it's like the only a way they can... historical curiosity. The only the way they can defend the uh, putting religious monuments yeah. up on public land is it's to say, oh, well, it, it's to strip it of its meaning and say, well, it's not really religious. Well, then why have it up there? Yeah. Clearly. But what is hilarious about this whole sum of thing, right? <laughs> and I checked these guys out, and we'll get to that in a yeah. second. Yeah. But... Um, it's perfectly true, right? If you have the uh, rules and regulations, so to speak, <laughs> of, of one particular yeah. faith, some, uh, a, a list of commandments, as it were, specific to one particular faith on public land, then if you want to be fair, you got to have everybody else's. Okay? Yep. And, but, this is why, but this is why we have separation of church and state, right? Because you can't because the framers of the Constitution and the Founding Fathers recognized this quandary. Oh, wait a minute. If you yeah. have one and you don't allow all the others, then what you're doing is you're showing favoritism to the one. Yeah. And the government shouldn't be, in, that shouldn't be the government's job. The government shouldn't be in that position to say, we recognize and favor this one faith just because it happens to be the majority faith. So we'll go ahead and give it special dispensation and say, and all you folks who have minority faiths, you're not as good. Yeah as the folks who happen to believe in the yeah. majority. That's part of the reason mm -hmm. we deny the request in the first place, Godfrey said. We see the obvious problem with doing that. Mm -hmm. we, would, we would very likely have a religious monument forest on our hands. Because right. they would have to allow absolutely everybody with any wacko faith mm -hmm. to come and put up a little stone monument to there. So clearly the solution has to whatever. be... All or nothing, the and the only logical one is nothing. The Ten Commandments have got to come down. Yeah. And so this, and there are challenges happening now on a nationwide scale about these things. Almost every day, yeah. you'll hear about a new monument that's yeah. being challenged. And again, if this is, and this yeah. isn't about oh, let's stamp out religion, let's, let's get God of course out of not. it. Of course no, not. this is about not allowing the government to dictate, even indirectly, by playing favorites. 
Yeah. You know, which religion is the acceptable religion for American citizens to practice? Yeah. You know, the Constitution says, no, faith is a matter of individual concern. Yeah. The ga government cannot restrict, but it cannot promote either. So take these Ten Commandments monuments. I'm sure you'll find some big church, big Christian oh, church yeah. in that town that will be delighted to plop it in its front lawn. And we have absolutely no problem with doing that. That's where if it belongs. If the hardware store wants to put up Ten Commandments on their front, exactly. on their front sidewalk, go for it. Well, not on the front sidewalk because that's owned by the city. But if they it have a okay. parking lot okay, that but they yeah, own, parking lot, anything, they could put set it us, up. Yeah, go ahead. They could lay mortar down. They could take one space and go blam, and yeah. that's their private property. Go for it. Put it there. Okay. But if you're going to say public land, it's got to be all or nothing, and yeah. the Constitution makes it abundantly clear. The yeah. most sensible recourse is nothing. Exactly. Um, just yes. for amusement Let's purposes. Let's hear about these people, shall we? I checked out the, what the Summum Faith was, um, and I went to their website. They have a website, summum.org. It's this weird uh, New Agey sort of uh, ancient yeah. Egyptian pyramid power stuff. They have... Uh, their symbol is like the wings, of these Egyptian wings. Have you seen okay. them before? Yeah. But they have a pentagram in the middle. So they're wow. trying to... Okay. <laughs> but they say it's not satanic. And they actually have a pretty elaborate website in terms of... And like, you know, there's like okay. Flash and HTML and XML. Oh, no. all this. So, uh, um, but um, <laughs> clearly these people are lunatic. For, okay, for example, the seven aphorisms that they would like to have on their own little plaque next to the Ten Commandments um, involve... Let's see, they have the principle of psychokinesis. Which is like some sci-fi concept where yep. you move so moves up with your mind. It says summum is mind thought. The universe is a mental creation, uh, but that they contradict that in a little bit. Uh, there's the principle of correspondence, principle of vibration. So write your mom. Nothing rests. Everything moves. Everything vibrates. Uh, principle of opposition, uh, rhythm, cause and effect, a gender. They say everything has masculine and feminine principles. So these are their seven aphorisms. Apparently, the f uh, this little religious sect was started in uh, 1975 by a guy who was an ex-Mormon who claims to have uh, met some space aliens uh, <laughs> and they gave him all of this info, uh, all of this incredible... Um, and, you know, these space aliens who have the ability to traverse light years. Yes. So, apparently, their, their scientific knowledge must be amazingly vast, right? But when they get to Earth, what do they do? They tell us things like, everybody really ought to love everybody. <laughs> You guys came all this way for that? <laughs> Duh! Yeah. But anyway, uh, this, so this guy um, and changed his name to Amen Ra, which, pretty, which is the which you know, is Egyptian it? god. Um, but on, also on their website, they have a little section called uh, Divine Sexuality. And apparently, their uh, creation myth involves, uh, well, here it is. God is a masturbator. God began creation by masturbation. <laughs> this is from the well, there was nobody else around. So. You, you, <laughs> you, know, you, you think I'm making this up, people. <laughs> uh, it is, and they say on the website, it is the most divine of all metaphors. The universe was created with a big bang through the masturbation <laughs> of God. <laughs> I couldn't make this up, I promise you. And it's on the website, and it's, and it's accompanied by uh, these illustrations. Oh, oh of, God, images. <laughs> yes, which in, in, in dubious taste, you might say. Um, so, so, Are we sure these aren't some quacks that are trying to do it to prove a point rather than... Well, I don't know. I mean, how do you tell the difference between... Deli uh, True. It's, it's, it's so weird. An actual belief in plain no, delusion. I, it, it is so creepy and delusional, right, that I don't think it can be... Well, obviously it's made up, but it's made up by a, some nut who really believes it. It's not some guy who is making something up that he knows he's making up for a joke. Okay. You know, but the, so clearly these people are nuts, right? And, and this is summum.org, folks. You can look it up for yourself. But you know, they say things like, uh, the website also has quotes like, nothing and possibility came in and out of bond infinite times in a finite moment. Okay, which is a statement that is so devoid of rational content that you can't even have an opinion about it. I mean, it says nothing. So all right, so these guys are loons, which makes this whole situation in Ogden, Utah, particularly hilarious <laughs> because... What the court has said is, you know, these guys' lunatic belief yeah. system are just as good as yours. <laughs> yep. And the Mormon. So in the middle of Mormon land, yeah. they've got to say God is a masturbator. My goodness, I tell you. <laughs> now, uh, if Yowch. you go to the website, folks, prepare to be offended by some images there. But uh, if if you're inclined to be offended by that kind of thing, but it's summum.org. S-U-M-M-U-M.org. Uh, 
So, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> so that's what's going on. And the court <laughs> has just ruled in this group's favor for having their seven <laughs> aphorisms. I think it, what I'd like to see, obviously, what should happen is the whole thing will get appealed, and what will end up is the Ten Commandments monument yeah. will have to be moved yeah. to a church property or something like that. Yeah. And then these some guys... It's the only logical thing. You know, for all I know, some of them's just the one dude, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> I mean, possible. It could just be this one guy living off in UFO land, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, extreme. I'd like to see how he gets converts. I mean, um, <laughs> well, extreme. It probably goes down to the adult bookstores. And, <laughs> but ex extreme hilarity this week involving this. Okay, I've just got a brief thing to talk about okay. before we go because I know you have a thing yep. to do. Um, uh, just a quick news uh, that I noticed on my way here. The Pope apparently spoke today, just today, publicly for the first time about the, uh, oh. the molestation scandal. Okay. You know, he's ha he had this little convocation of bishops that made no one happy and recently. But this is for he came out today, essentially. And what he said pretty much amounted to these events are terrible and tragic and they've filled our hearts with sadness and shame. But if you love Jesus, you must love the church. And it, see, you have that look on your face <laughs> that you're making this up, aren't you, Martin? Look on your face. All right. He said what it amounted to was... Don't let the actions of the bad priest, bad priests, yeah, influence overshadow yeah. The, all the good priests who are out there doing good things. Point taken. But it ain't exactly an apology, is it? And it's certainly not a condemnation. Yeah. You know what the Pope needed to do and should have done in this case was he had an opportunity not to equivocate and just come out and condemn what went on. Not only the the this most was horrible. The if it ever happens again. Mm -hmm. If it ever happens again, yeah. we'll come down They're like right. a ton of bricks. Yeah, and we're out of there. And the, and and, but again, remember at the Vatican when he summoned, they summoned uh, Cardinal Law, who was covering up for Shanley. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sent him over to the Vatican, and they told him, "Don't resign your post." Yeah. They told him, "Don't leave." Yeah. Wh so he had an opportunity to come out and show that the Vatican has any degree of moral authority at all on this matter. He didn't do it, and it's really despicable. Um, the most important thing, clearly, to a church leader is protect the church. That's yeah. the most important thing. to any, any leader in any religion is protect the religion. Yes. The religion is more important than anything. It's more important than raped children. It's more important than covering up crimes. Yep. Protect the power base. And... Uh, so it's really, really, and so some people are, are of course, spinning and making excuses for the Pope, and other people are bravely saying this wasn't enough. But anyway, yeah. Anyway, you know, they just uh, have an op have op they, they, They're given so many opportunities to make it right, and they just don't want to do it. Um, I'm done. I think I've said okay. what I have to say. And there's also one quick story that I forgot about. Uh -huh. uh, it was actually posted on Monday. I saw it originally. When I actually looked for the link, it had disappeared. You can't find it anymore because apparently the news site updates it every day or whatever, and they, oh, okay. they toss out the old stuff, which is very oh. strange. Mm. Um, but the mm. Ten Commandments monument in Austin, Texas, is apparently going to be, uh, it's going to court. Oh, challenged, right. Yes, it's being right. challenged. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Van Orton. Okay. I can't remember his first name. Mm -hmm. uh, Van Orton, who's actually going to uh, challenge mm -hmm. the constitutionality of having that monument up, yeah, um, and the the hearing is tomorrow, okay, on Monday, okay, and uh, apparently I think we're going to have a little gathering down there. I, if I, what somebody. time is it? Do we know? Because uh, it's early in the morning. Yeah, they, probably, they said get there at because uh, News Eight Austin is going to be there also. Okay. Uh, they said be there around six thirty or six forty-five in the a.m. Wow. So and then it's when does the actual hearing start? I don't know because I can probably come to it at the beginning. I'll have to. I'm probably helping a friend move tomorrow. Okay. Uh, but at least maybe I can come for like the opening bits. And yeah. Maybe talk to News Eight Austin or something. Because yeah, I'd love to go to the protest. Who have I, been really I, good I, to us? Yes. News Eight Austin. Yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. times. Um, and I'd really like to see the hearing and everything else. But yeah. oh, that is early. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Do you work tomorrow? No. Ah, then you which might. is which is why because I could sleep in. Uh, no. <laughs> but you're not unused to the idea of getting up early, like. Yes, I don't start work till like eleven thirty in the morning. Oh, ah. <laughs> uh, Six o'clock in the morning is the middle of the night. Mm. <laughs> nah, yeah. <laughs> so, hey, well, that's okay. what naps are for. <laughs> you know? Never underestimate the almighty nap. <laughs> 
Okay, what I've got to go over here is a little uh, thing I've prepared. We, we often get the same kind of questions that touch on the same thing mm -hmm. pretty often on the show. And so There's I thought always it'd be, new viewers. Yeah, I thought it'd be kind of nice to have a time to sit down and explain <coughs> some of the arguments and ideas that we have a little bit more in depth, and we're not hurried by having a caller on the line who's changing no. topics or offering new ideas or blah 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 blah. Oh, it's just, a spring. This is, a, this so. is our fireside chat then. Yes. We have a fireplace. Yes, we have a neat little fireplace yes. here, and a golden retriever. Get a cup of coffee and a glass of wine. Yes. <laughs> so this is. Uh, <laughs> This is our version of it on <laughs> <laughs> public access television. Okay, so in other words, so what you want to do is like uh, where we go over some of the basic Some of the basic ideas. The basic critiques, basic ideas. Exactly, and see. see how they work and give a little bit more in-depth than we may get, you know, with a caller on the line. All right, well, tally-ho. Uh, first one I want to go over uh, is the problem of evil. It's mm. a pretty standard one. It's, it's really common. And basically the idea of it is... Typically, the Christian faith defines God as being all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-good. He can do anything he wants, he knows absolutely everything, and he loves everything. He doesn't want any, any bad to come to anybody or anything. Um, now, the problem with this, though, is there's a logical inconsistency. They have bad things that happen in the world. There are car accidents, plane crashes, hurricanes, tornadoes, and cancer. Uh, many bad things happen in the world, and how can this be if God can do something about it if he so wants to, because it's all-powerful? He knows that it's going on, he's omniscient, and he doesn't want bad things to happen to people because he's omnibenevolent. Um, that is basically the crux of the argument. Mm -hmm. Relatively simple. Yeah. How do you explain an imperfect world with a perfect with God? a perfect God who's right. in control and made it all. Right. Um, basically, the, the discussions usually come up when Christians offer explanations for this. And they say, well, yeah, I understand your point, and that, that sounds valid, but what about... Oh, and I forgot to bring the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. The first one was uh, short-term evils for long-term good. In other words... Oh, you're talking about the book, uh, The Case for the Faith. The Case for Faith. You're, yeah, you're writing yes. a rebuttal. Uh, Lee Strobel wrote this book, which is a big yep. Christian bestseller. Yep, the and you've case been, for faith. You've been critiquing it and writing a rebuttal. Yeah. Which and is pretty cool. I've, I've read what you've sent me so far. And kind so. of a brief summary of that. Okay. A little bit. Um, but basically the first one was, again, short-term evils for long-term good. You can foresee something good coming out of this bad event. And so in God's infinite wisdom, maybe he's going to allow some of this stuff to happen because he knows that a greater good will come of it. The problem with that is that we allow bad things to happen because we have no choice. For instance, uh, getting surgery. We don't have a way that we can just magically go into somebody and remove the tumor or whatever the bad thing is and, and not, not cause any pain or suffering. We have no choice but to allow certain bad things to happen because we know a greater good will happen. Well, now, wait a second. I mean... Cancer is not a thing that... Sometimes things just happen, right? Yes. We don't allow tornadoes to happen. They just do. Yes. They just hit us. Yes. Yeah. We, there's nothing we can do preemptively. Yes, but a tornado perhaps could, you know, move a couple things around or do something magical, you know, in God's great plan that it'll actually clear out space for a new shopping mall. And not, Who knows? not kill a bunch of trailer park people. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That, that's a small loss yeah. for a new, you know, shopping center. Yeah. Um, in other words, an all-powerful God ought to be able to prevent tragic, evil events from happening exactly. that serve no purpose other than to hurt people. Exactly. Even right. if there is a greater good that will eventually come out of this, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we can see, or mm -hmm. something like that, an infinitely powerful, infinitely knowing God should have thought of a way to get the good benefits that were going to come out of it without having to kill people or hurt somebody or, you know, make a new shopping mall. <laughs> you know, they, they should be a better way to do should, things here, people. Yeah. We should get our shopping mall without exactly too many people dying anyway. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah, who wants so, to be right? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, God's all-powerful. He should be able to do whatever he wants, get whatever good benefits without hurting anybody. I've heard, I've heard one amusing response to this, but I'm going to let you... Uh, <laughs> okay. Do you want me to... Well, yeah, well. There is a show on Trinity Broadcasting that I, I've caught occasionally. It's called Reasons to Believe, and it's hosted by a guy named Hugh Ross, Dr. Hugh Ross, yeah. uh, who is the guy who also runs this completely bogus website called godandscience.org. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And this is one of these websites that attempts to reconcile Christianity with science. And the website does it very, very badly. <laughs> but, um, but at least Dr. Hugh Ross has, you know, he's educated in the sciences. Okay. Right? He's not just some total nimrod. Uh, <laughs> but his conclu his, the connections that he attempts to make and the way he attempts to use science to reconcile his religious beliefs, uh, I think are very transparently silly. But one response that I heard because I actually addressed this on one of their shows, was earthquakes. They gave the example of earthquakes. Oh. <laughs> and uh, the justification was that earthquakes are this thing that sh shift minerals around in <laughs> the, s the Earth's crust, which is supposedly a good thing in the long term. Yes. Now, if it, I guess, wipes out a few cities and kills several thousand people and leaves several hundred thousand people homeless, Oh well, at least yeah. we have. At least we now have more. At salt least, at least we've the shifted top. the soil a bit to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, but again, you're right. A God who is all powerful, you know. Yeah. I mean, absolutely no limits whatsoever to his divine powers. Power and knowledge could be shifting the soil right under our feet as we speak through his magical means, and we wouldn't feel a thing, right? Yeah. We'd be going about our life, and soil, you know, mo various molecules of various minerals and would be teleporting to one buildings. area, layer of the strata, where the stuff that's less yeah. used... Yeah, and this can all be going on, and nobody's being hurt at all. Yeah. And you get the good without the bad. So <laughs> it's... <laughs> that's a pretty extreme one there. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but th th that's, those are the extremes yeah. to which they're willing to go to justify... Yeah. Uh, any sort of wacky, kooky yeah. <laughs> reconciliation yeah. between yeah. obvious natural disasters that do serve no purpose but to hurt people, really, yeah. when you think about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just can't think of the good that can come of you yeah. know, just uh, people is, who is are... Is the good that's going to come out of an earthquake third world really country, that much better than the... Some people in some third world yeah. country who are economically depressed and have poor living conditions in the first place then just getting hit with a tidal wave. Yeah, you know, there's that's just like insult to injury. Yeah. I don't, I just don't see what the good that could possibly come of it. Yeah. Even if, well, you know, the town will eventually get rebuilt, and they'll, you know, the survivors will move back. What? That's the good. How is that good for the people I who know. died? It's not good for the people who died. I know. Right. So anyway, you again, he should have had a better way of doing it. Uh, next one that commonly comes up: free will. Well, he would have had a better way of doing it. All yes. powerful, all, all knowing, knowing, omnibenevolent would have had a better way of doing it. Yes. Not just should have. Yeah. Anyway, please continue. Uh, free will is the next good, next good one that they always bring up with. You know, sure. we have we have to be free to make choices in our life, and mm -hmm. and you know, so we can choose to do bad things. Uh, whose free will is more important, though? Uh, that that's one argument. I mean, if I want to kill somebody, is my free will to kill somebody more important than the the free will of the person who's getting killed, who's just trying to get their coffee and doesn't really want to die that day? Mm -hmm. um, apparently, he's he's assuming that mine is more, and mine is better, and mm -hmm. so I mean, it, it, that's a very twisted way to take it. Yeah. And if he's going to cause some kind of harm in that instance by stopping mm -hmm. me from doing it, the harm that's done to me, I'm annoyed because I couldn't kill that person like I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But chances are, the amount of good that they're going to get out of it is significantly more like, than the mm -hmm. downside to mine. Continuing to be alive. Right? Exactly. That's that's yeah. kind of a good thing for them. Yeah, what the free will defense. Yeah. Uh, uh, the and problem of evil. There's a bigger one than that. Yeah. The the main thing. Let me just touch on this really quick. Okay. Go the on, main sorry, thing go about ahead. free will is uh, there is no free will involved in a tidal wave, or an earthquake. Right. Well, duh. Yeah. Or a hurricane. <laughs> yeah, obviously. You know, you're not stopping anybody's free will there. Mm -hmm. That's stuff that just happens. Right. But what the free will defense against the problem of evil doesn't take into consideration is that the issue here is morally resp moral responsibility, morally responsible behavior. Yes. Okay, their claim is that God is the source of human morality. So you would expect the being that is the source of all of our morality to exhibit moral perfection in all things, to be the ultimate moral authority. And the way you be yeah. the ultimate moral authority is that you exhibit morally responsible behavior at all times. Yes. Now, a morally responsible being if this being knows some bad things about to happen and can stop it, okay, like me, I don't claim to be perfect, right? But if I was on the cell phone and I overheard yeah. some signal of guys going like, yeah, man, tomorrow we're going to blow up, you know, so-and-so, yeah. I'd be like, uh-oh, uh ding, ding. And <laughs> I would say, I, I would call the police, I would do what I could, you know, I'd get as much information as I could, and, and I would go to, to, go to the it. authorities and say, I overheard a phone call. I think some crime's about to take place. Yeah. This is what I heard. Um, please, you know, do something about it, or please look into it. And, yeah. and I'd cooperate with the authorities and help them stop this if yeah. I knew what was going to happen. So a morally responsible being would do that. 
in not doing it, you assume responsibility for the evil act a certain yeah. degree. Yeah. If you could have stopped it and chose not to, yeah. you therefore share some of the responsibility. This is why a guy named Michael Fortier, who was a chum of Timothy McVeigh's, okay. Okay, is cooling his ass in prison for 12 oh, years. Oh, yeah. Because he didn't actually participate in the bombing. He yeah. didn't make the bomb. But he didn't he stop helped, it either. He helped McVeigh build, you know, buy some of his fertilizer and, you know, and stuff. But he knew it was going to happen. He didn't physically participate and yeah. go to OKC that morning and do it. Yeah. But he knew it was going to happen. He yeah. knew McVeigh had these plans. McVeigh was designing the bomb uh, in his kitchen. He was, like, putting soup cans out in, in order to determine a configuration to, to okay. he want he was trying to design a shaped charge so that the okay. blast would go towards the building okay. okay and he was doing his initial designs on michael fortier's kitchen floor using soup cans <laughs> of how to lay out the barrels of yeah. you know hopped up fertilizer right so fortier knew didn't report it didn't do anything to stop it yeah. the government says that makes you responsible dude yeah you're going to prison so he's in prison yeah you know no different there than a god who knows that a bunch of terrorists are going to be crashing planes tomorrow. Into buildings, yep. And just sits back and goes, hmm. Can't you know, affect their free will. You know. Hands off. Right. So. so. All right, so that's why free will doesn't work in that defense. Yep. Okay. We can go ahead and, um, we'll go ahead and put the number up uh, to okay. let the phone calls rack up while Ashley continues his presentation. Okay. It's going very well, Ashley. Uh, next one is uh, people generally learn from their mistakes, which, again, is a, Somewhat valid point. You know, we go through life, we make mistakes, but you'll learn from them. So there's a greater good coming there. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never actually learned anything on purpose by making a mistake. The reason I make mistakes is because somebody isn't there or I don't know how to do it correctly the first time. I have never intentionally, you know, stubbed my toe so I can know, ooh, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know, Teach these people that this is a better way to do things. You don't. You don't have to allow them to make mistakes. You know. Do you allow your toddler to make mistakes? You know. You want to learn about electricity? Okay. There's an outlet. Mm -hmm. Here's a couple coat hangers. <laughs> you know. Go learn now. Yeah. You know, you'll learn from your mistakes. Yeah. You know. But then again, it's not a mis the guys. All, uh, all these terrible, horrible things happening with kidnapped children in the last couple of weeks. The guys doing these, these terrible crimes yeah. and these murders of these kids. They're not making mistakes, okay? <laughs> these are deliberately, <laughs> deliberately planned Oops. evil acts, right? These are these guys who are yeah. messed up in the head. They're not making mistakes, and then, yeah, and you can't s justify it by saying, oh, well, you know, the minute he got arrested and got sentenced to death row, I guess, well, well, I learned from my mistakes, so that's the good that came out of, you know, yeah. killing a five-year-old <laughs> child. Wrong, uh-uh. Yeah. No. So, so, again, you're right, but it's, it's a mistake when you stub your toe by accident. It's, yeah. it's a mistake when you like uh, forget to enter a, 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 a check in your ledger and so you, you your checkbook balancing is messed yeah. up for the months. Those are mistakes. Okay. Crashing planes into buildings. <laughs> you don't go, oops. Yeah, kidnapping kids. It's like, hmm, let me learn from this. <laughs> Boom. You know. Well, in the nanosecond before my death, I've learned that maybe I shouldn't crash planes into buildings anymore. Uh -uh. I'll use that one for the rest of my yeah. life. Well, that's clearly the weakest defense. <laughs> learning from mistakes. Yeah. Must yeah. be the weakest, absolutely. Uh, can't take away freedoms. Again, this is similar to free will. We have to have choices in our life. Mm -hmm. And choices obviously must include bad things. But not really. When I got up this morning, I had the choice to go to the meeting, uh, work at a shelter, volunteer my time at a shelter. Mm -hmm. I could go to work, I could sleep in, I could see a movie. Mm -hmm. Is my free will and my freedom being that constrained if I don't have the choice to kill my neighbor and kick the cat? Or if it doesn't even occur to you to consider those as choices. True. Right. No. Free, free, even if it yeah. did, is my, cho is my freedom being constrained so tightly mm -hmm. that, you know, darn, I can't kick the cat. Well, again, the, the whole free will argument at its core is really bogus, right? I mean, because there are limitations on what you can do simply based upon what sort of life forms we are, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I would really love to be able to fly, you know, but I can't. You know, I mean, to flap my arms and go. God is the man has that my is holding you down. Has my free will <laughs> been infringed upon simply yeah. because biologically I'm not made to where I can flap my arms and fly through the air? So not all issues are free will issues. And as you very well pointed out, free will does not imply that you have to have an infinite number 
of choices to make. It simply means that you have to have you you, you have you to have, have a choice. some choices. Or a, a choice. Yeah. Even if it's just like, uh, do I want to, to have a mocha java or a cafe latte? <laughs> You're free. You know, that's at least that's a choice. You don't have to have nine thousand different flavors of coffee to yeah. choose from. You know, including some that are like like cyanide based like poison, so, right? Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, exactly. So. So yes, my free will is infringed every mm -hmm. time I go to the coffee store because I can't kill okay. myself with their right. coffees. Well, let's go ahead and reach our <laughs> conclusion so that we can take our first caller. Okay. Uh, you. Because well, they probably have some opinions on yeah, this. Yeah, I'll skip over one or two. You had said that learning from mistakes is the the weakest one. Well, at least that I've heard so far. Absolutely not. Oh. <laughs> uh, the fact that he's using the standard of good to judge evil, the fact that he's saying quite rightly that this horrible suffering isn't what it ought to be, means that he has a notion of what ought to be. That this notion cor corresponds to something real and that there is, therefore, a reality called the supreme good. Well, that's another name for God. The fact that we're no. saying there's good and bad in the world means that there's a God. The problem of evil proves there's a God. No. Complete the problem of bullshit. evil proves that human beings are able to observe. Yes. The, the fact that we can observe good results of actions versus bad results of actions only proves that human beings are capable of making judgments yeah. about things they observe. Yeah. Okay. There is no <laughs> standard objective morality in the world. Get over it, yeah. people. Yeah. We make up rules to live in society that benefit mo more people than it hurts. Those are the mm -hmm. rules we live by. It's good if but we they're not arbitrary. say it's good. But, but, but when you say we make them up, it's, we don't make them up in an arbitrary sense. We make it's made up. It's made up in the sense that it helps more people. Yeah, and than it, it and hurts. that is the result of observed facts. We yes. observe where it's it's knowledge that's applied. It yes. is the result of applied knowledge. Yes. We have, you know, human beings over the years scads of it. <laughs> have seen what results when you do a certain thing versus yeah. what you do in a different thing. And if the results are helpful and beneficial to people as opposed to harmful, well, yeah. then those are the ones we're going to go with. Yeah. You can observe these things. Yeah. You know, and uh, and it's good if society says you're right. it's good. That is, that is very weak. That's the, pro that's, that's the crux of it. Yeah. So that's the main stuff. I can get onto one or two of these other ones, but, mm -hmm. but those are the main the main arguments, the free will, sure. the sure. Well, <laughs> good proves that there is a God. Well, very well done, so. and I'd be, I'd be, I'm very excited to read uh, more of your refutation so. of uh, the case for faith as you continue it. Okay, yeah, because I'm trying to go through chapter by chapter and do it. Yeah. And some of them are very, very target-rich environments. Oh, yeah. it's, well, it's these things, horrible. They, you know, they are, they're, sometimes they're short in the telling, right, but they're long in the refuting. Because yeah. your refutation of this book is going to end up being pretty much almost as long as the book, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> So, yeah, more or less. Good. Um, but some of the stuff, I mean, I have a hard time refuting it because I, I don't know whether it, it's, it's so outrageous <laughs> that, that I'm thinking about, if I just put the quote here, that'll be enough. <laughs> because people will read it and just go, my God, what the it's hell is he thinking? self -centrism. It It's just well, so no, outrageous. Well, uh, no, because apparently most of his audience don't get why it's outrageous. You really do need to explain yeah. why some of these ideas are just... I mean, the simple thing, like, you know, God created life, therefore he can take it away. I know, but they—it's that, that, outrageous. What? It's outrageous to <laughs> us. But I was in a lane for about two weeks. I was in this email debate yeah. with a Christian woman who watched our program and decided that she, her special task was to okay. try to win me over, <laughs> <Convert> right? <you. laughs> and she was very sincere and everything. But she—I'll tell you how she justified it, and we'll get to our callers right after this. She basically said, and this is another defense I've heard against the problem of evil. Okay. Which is that everything God does is good. Period. So when, he, he, so when he kills babies, that's, that's a right. good it, thing. It becomes a good thing when God does it. Nothing that God does can possibly <laughs> be bad. And okay. words mean different things when applied to God. That's another one that I've heard. Uh, that, example? Okay, for example, um, well, since God is all good, okay, then you, can't, you cannot be? apply human standards of good and evil to God at all. Because yeah. God is all good. He has this divine level of goodness that's above and beyond anything we mere mortals can aspire to. So when God decides, I'm going to send an earthquake to wipe out all these poor people in this little what area. What moronic argument is that? Well, it's very moronic, but they take it very seriously. You know, it's, they're dogmas. They're dogmas that she, she essentially said, I, I base everything that I believe on these two um, principles that she called them. But they were actually dogmas. And what they very were was, you know, God can do no wrong ever at all. God's ultimately good and does no evil. Okay. okay, and everything God does, everything Have God... Have you ever killed anyone? Yeah, but they were all bad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, there you go. 
<laughs> maybe maybe God is Arnold short. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's that's what I've heard. On that, on that, so that's how they justify that. So it's important to explain. Even if it sounds like self evidently so crazy to kooky. us, it's important to yeah. uh, to um, yeah. to to explain the point. Oh, uh, now oh we've got God. callers lined up, and yep, the things look like a Christmas tree. So uh, I'm sure that uh, thank you, Ashley. Okay, let's see what uh, David has to say on line one. Dave, Hello. wait, we got to take oh. some of our feedback down. There you go, David. How you doing? Uh, pretty good. I want to uh, comment on some things. It seems like you can take September 11th and uh, earthquakes and tornadoes and all these quote-unquote bad things. Well, you don't think uh, September 11th was a bad thing? Well, here's the thing, though. Um, if God doesn't exist, um, what do we do now that September 11th and earthquakes happen? What do we do now? If God doesn't exist, we yeah. do what we would do anyway, which is we attempt to prevent... If, for example, in the yeah. case of terrorist activities, we need to round these people up and either kill them or make so sure that they, they don't, don't do it again, or throw them in prison forever, or, or put them on trial, and you know, make sure that their apparatus for hurting people is taken away. And in the case of natural disasters, it's true there's very little you can do. All the, the best you can do is attempt to predict them. Um, you, you know what parts of the world are these dangerous spots to live in. We know where the earthquake yeah. zones are. We know where... Technology also allows you to try and fight back against them. You can have special building construction that isn't, sure. you know, as likely to fall down. So we would, do what, we would do what we would do anyway, so. which is to maximize the, the quality and the standard of life for everyone possible and uh, make sure that at least people are educated in, so that you know what to do in an earthquake situation. I visited a buddy of mine who lived out in L.A. and they okay. have this, you know, he showed me, like I was staying with him and he said, Here's the bathroom, here's the living room, and here's the earthquake kit in case <laughs> something... Because they'd wow. recently had a couple of big tremors, okay. and, and it had like a, some just you know, like a granola bars and a flashlight, and, and, wow. and he said, and you always make sure that your shoes or a pair of slippers are like where you can get them if you wake up in the middle of the night and the building's rocking. God, so, scary. <laughs> yeah, we would do what we would do anyway, which is to make sure that everyone's well-educated and that people are protected and made safe and... Uh, um, you know, whether I think whether there's a God or not would be irrelevant to that fact. People, uh, I think, have a... Uh, it is natural for people to help one another. Yeah. It is natural. Hmm. Um, do, do you believe that you have free will? Or is everything determined? Well, I don't think that... I mean, if everything is determined, then obviously we don't. I... Uh, it, it's a hard... How do you answer that question? I it, mean... It's a tough one because... Well, here's the thing. If, if, if you... If everything were predetermined, okay, it would... It might very well still seem to you as if you had free yeah. will because yeah. you could be going around saying, I'm going to decide to do this today and I'm going to decide to do that today. And although you might be thinking you're making those decisions, there could be some strange cosmic script that you're following yeah. about which you know nothing. Um... But, of course, I don't have any evidence that that's the case. So as far as I'm concerned, yes, I do try to make decisions for myself in life. The decisions that I make, obviously, are based upon, you know, the principles and the ethical standards that I've developed just over, you know, 36 years of life. It's, uh, it's possible. Uh, basically, since we're basically made up of uh, chemical processes and stuff like that, which essentially follow natural chemical laws that we are essentially just really, really complicated meat machines. <laughs> and essentially, you know, <laughs> if you could understand all the particles in our body and how they work and how chemistry works, you could determine exactly where we'll all be in 10 years from now. This is exactly the subject my dad's going to talk about. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Um, good. Well, so. I've, j I've just been told by our producer that uh, we have a guest coming on the show two weeks, two weeks from now. Who's, who's going to talk about this kind of yeah. uh, thing in a little bit more detail. Yeah. We've had him on the show before. It's Professor uh, ja Jack? That's my dad, Alan yeah. Glasser. Alan Glasser. Alan Glasser. Alan Glasser. Well, I was trying okay. to get his name out of you. <laughs> 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 Professor Alan Glasser, who is going to be uh, on the program. Yeah. and uh, we'll be t He talked earlier, last time he was on the show, he talked about... Uh, Big Bang cosmology yeah. and physics, yeah. and now yeah. apparently he's going to be talking about this, yeah. so that should be very Talk about the big last time, the small this time. So. <laughs> yeah, I just saw a show with Richard Dawkins and mm -hmm. some other lady, and mm -hmm. they were talking about memes, and basically they were saying that there's no uh, such thing as free will uh, mm -hmm. or love or any of that stuff, but um, you were talking about um, beneficial, like we should observe uh, Richard stuff, Dawkins and in I, I think when you say that you, sh you should really kind of choose the good, um, I mean, that, that can be taken so many ways, like what if uh, uh, a kid
kid and his mom decide to knock off their father and get a bunch of money, get, a, get all this money for, for their good. I mean, what, it seems like that, that's a very difficult position to take because, well, this is what I define as good and what you should, well, no, this is what I define as good and useful. And it's well, not really. Yeah. Not really. The amount of bad that would come out of having this guy dead <laughs> is significantly worse than the amount of good that they're going to get from, you know, a two hundred thousand dollar policy or yeah, whatever. Well, there's another, there's a, there's a, there's a more important point to talk about though, and that is that people don't exist in a vacuum, right? Yeah. So, and not most people, the majority of people, do not simply just make decisions on, well, what's just good for me? You know, there's a big picture to look at, and most people. Uh, you make your decisions within the context of the society and the culture in which you live. So, and there is a cultural consensus that most people follow simply because it is practical and makes good sense to do so. Yeah. And the people who, as you've indicated, go uh, set themselves aside and say, no, no, I'm just going to do something strictly for my benefit and I don't care who else I hurt, so I'll go ahead and kill someone and take their money or do this or that or the other thing, we call those people criminals, and we, th we, have, we throw them in prison, and our prisons are full of them. So, yes, there are people who are like that, but um, those are people who, uh, either through just antisocial tendencies or what have you, they don't really share this sort of uh, social compact that we have with one another, I guess you could call it, through society, yeah. where there is a cultural consensus as to, and, and, that's, and that is how we have arrived at the rules we have in the first place. It's not people observing things and saying, okay, well, what did I get out of this? It's about... What was beneficial for most people? What you know, well, growing you know, growing crops and can feed the farmer and his family, but then he can also make sure that those crops are available to his yeah. community, and then it's all a big give and take. And since something most people been, understand that, and the people who don't go to jail. And since mm -hmm. it's something we've been doing for hundreds of thousands of years, about millions of years, mm -hmm. it's essentially a natural reaction now. When I put my hand on a hot stove, I don't go, ooh, an evolutionary process has told me that <laughs> burning my flesh is a bad thing, therefore I should take my hand off. It doesn't work like that. It's a natural reaction. Damn. Pull it away. <laughs> the yeah. same thing. If I, if I have, you know, if Martin ticks me off and I just go, you know, feel like smacking him. Oh, you've, it, as it, you've it, have so many times. <laughs> it, the, <laughs> the initial instinct is, ooh, nope, shouldn't do that. Why? Because over, you know, a million plus years, we've decided that that's eh, probably not a good thing. The overall benefits aren't going to be that much. Yeah, most people realize that so you say, nope, okay. That the way you get along with people is not to, to be smacking along. them across the face all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's how. That's how you. There's a recipe. If if we lived in some weird alien planet where I think I might have read some funny science fiction story about this one time where they, everybody communicates by you know beating each other up or something. Or <laughs> I read one science fiction story one time. Those where are there aliens was, we don't want to meet. Yeah, there were some. There were some. There was like a race of aliens that were so ugly that they could only reproduce by being stepped on. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but we don't live in that kind of bizarre, backwards, strange culture where it's a good thing to go around smacking people yeah. around. We 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 understand how good behave. We understand what the good behaviors are, and, and we just uh, fall in that way because we're social species. Yeah. You know, well, people thrive together; they don't thrive separate from each other. Well, I was reading in a, in a news article that the Taliban and all those guys um, really believe that. America is uh, what they say the the, the uh, country of the devil, mm -hmm. the satanic country. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, um, they really didn't do anything wrong. The only thing that they did wrong was just step on our toes and the American culture. Well, they did a lot well, more than our toes. Well, I, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, right. Well, f you're right. Well, first off, hang on. Where did their idea that you know? Uh, where did their idea that we were the country of the devil come from? Where did that idea come from in the first place? It, it came from their it came from their their personal religious fanaticism. It came from their extremist, fundamentalist, fanatical interpretation of the Islamic faith. Oh, well, they could have gotten it from anywhere. Well, but, but they didn't, and Probably obviously, not. obviously, obviously, they didn't get it from anywhere. They got it from there. They had a specific way of practicing their religious faith that said, "We are the chosen ones of our deity." And all those guys over there in that country where they have tall buildings and rock music are the bad guys that our deity doesn't like. So we are now justified in going out and hurting them. Well, okay. they got off on the back of a cereal box. But, I mean, they, but they didn't. They didn't. It's but they didn't. where they got it from. Yes, which is, and, and so... So your argument's pointless. 
No, my argu mm -hmm. no, your, your argument that they could have gotten it from anywhere is pointless because they didn't just get it from anywhere. We know where they got it from. They got it from their interpretation of Islamic teachings. Okay. So you have to take that into account. And, uh, you know, whereas, I mean, and what has happened now? They've received the condemnation of the world and they are now being, we're at war with them. So clearly it wasn't okay for everyone. The, the consensus was. The global society has come to the conclusion that that's bad. Yeah, the global, and yeah, and so that's, that's what's going on with that. Anyway, we appreciate your call, David, and we're gonna have to get to our next guy, because okay. we're waiting long, but uh, thanks for calling, and uh, you know, let's hear back from you sometime, all right? Okay, you bet. Bye. Take care. Okay. All right, that's a good point. Greg is online too, let's see what he has to say. Greg? Hi. Hey, we're sorry to have uh, kept you waiting so long. Oh, that's fine. Um, I had kind of a question slash comment on the, the problem of evil. Okay. Um, Christians, I think, they, they believe that evil is called evil because it's against the nature of God, it's the opposite of God. Um, so, if evil entered the world, um, in a sense, God would have to turn his back on evil because he cannot coexist with evil. Um, and so they believe that only by God's grace he still, he still um, provides his providence um, and he still provides a way of, uh, quote, salvation to enter heaven. Mm -hmm. And so wouldn't it make more sense to ask the question, if we are, if we do sin, um, if we do things that are against the nature of God, him being totally good, wouldn't it be a better question to say, well, why does he allow good to happen to us at all if we are a sinful people or race? I mean, Well, here's the problem, first off with that. The minute you say that God can't do something, like God cannot coexist with evil, you have just stripped him of his omnipotence. Okay, an omnipotent being will have no limits to his power. So, um, it's true that the problem of evil will fail as a criticism of the nature of God yeah. if you are willing to allow that maybe God doesn't have all of the three omnis, that he doesn't possess either omniscience, the ability to know everything, omnipotence, the ability to do absolutely anything with no limits, or omnibenevolence, which is the, the uh, unlimited, uh, un, 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 uh, feel what's, good. What's, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Um, unconditional love. Yes. So if you're willing to say at least one of these properties can go away, then the problem of evil does lose some of its weight as a criticism. Loses all of its maybe, weight, personally. Maybe I mean that more mm -hmm. in the sense that say, I don't, say I don't like Tejano, Tejano music by mm -hmm. any means, and so I say, I can't be around Tejano music. Well, God is, he can be around evil, I mean, since, in the sense that, uh, I mean, he does uh, speak to people, and he has to save a sinner who then comes to salvation, but they were evil before that, so he does have contact with an evil person. But he provides, I mean, basically he, only by his grace, he still exists while providing so, some good So since he allows, so let me make sure I understand here, since he allows an out essentially and a way to become good, then essentially bad things happening is okay. Um, is that oh, correct? Mm, okay, what, what do you mean by okay? Like. Or just they're able to happen. Bad things are able to happen, again, because God sits back, lets you make the decision. But he offers a way to come to him. Offers a way to come to him. But that still has to do with the problem, uh, that, that still brings up the issue of moral responsibility. Yeah. Okay, that still brings up the issue of if tragedies are prevent preventable, and again, we're get, getting away from the issue of people's individual choices as to uh, what they do or do not do in life. And let's get to natural, again, natural disasters, okay? So, so, situations like floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, tidal waves, uh, volcanic eruptions, none of these are things that involve human beings making choices, yes. okay? And yet they are natural evils that occur in the world that result in death and mayhem and woe and horror. In, in these situations, when you have the ability to prevent a thing from happening and you choose not to do it, that calls into question uh, your moral responsibility and your, uh, and your moral authority. Yeah. So, um, and point. Uh, so allowing, you know, just sitting back and saying, you make the choice to come to me does not address the whole issue of moral responsibility for events that could. Yeah. And since God essentially, 
designed this world and designed everything, mm -hmm. he put that there in the first place. He knew that this was going to happen. Therefore, he essentially caused any problems that we have, any pain, suffering, torture, whatever, that just because you're going to offer an out or make it better in the end doesn't justify having the bad things in it in the first place. You can't beat your children if you promise to take them to, take them to McDonald's after it's over with. That doesn't make it right. Yeah. Well, he doesn't necessarily make it better in the end for everyone. Sometimes he makes it worse. Yeah. Christians would believe that he makes it worse in the end yeah. by, by uh, allowing people to go to a hell. Yeah. Exactly. And, but people have the choice. He doesn't send people to hell against their own volition. Well, sure he does. Well, I mean, think about it. Wait, wait. Who makes, who makes the rule in the first place that folks would go to hell for any reason whatsoever? Why would there be a hell for people to go there? And why, who would make the rule? Who's the one who's making the rule? Um, you know, don't do this and don't do that, and you will end up in hell. It's Watch got. Worship me, or fear my wrath, or <laughs> please fear my wrath, please. Thank you, Homer. Um, I mean, it's God who makes that rule. I mean, if most, a lot of people would just, uh, would just like to be left alone, and if you could make the choice either to join a particular religion or not, and still not have to suffer some terrible punishment for it, you know, I don't, I mean, why would anyone choose to go to a place called hell where they would be tortured for eternity? No, the most evil person who ever existed in the world wouldn't choose that. Well, yeah. first of all, the Bible describes a group of, uh, I think, angels in heaven, and they revolted against God, and then namely Lucifer and his followers, mm -hmm. and that God um, created a lake of fire for these demons and the, Satan and his fallen angels, it says, to go mm -hmm. to this hell for punishment of, for revolting. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this wasn't designed for people. He didn't create this hell because people started sinning. Because, started pe because people started sinning, he chose to then um, send these people to hell for not ultimately accepting him as a savior. Um, so he didn't design hell for sinners, but eventually that's what it turned But it turned out. out to be a good idea. Yeah. And so, and then there you get into the whole moral quandary of this idea of infinite punishment for finite evil. Yeah. Okay. And you know, like, uh, take the most evil person who ever existed in the history of the world. Let's, uh, let's just say it's Adolf Hitler, right? Okay. Adolf Hitler committed a finite number of crimes. Okay. He did. But the whole idea of eternal torment, eternal torture, without any idea towards the rehabilitative, <laughs> you know, potential yeah. of, pun I mean, punishment for the sake of punishment without any, f without any sort of, yeah. without really teaching you anything about it. Yeah. Uh, now, of course, for, well, some, right. for somebody like Hitler, maybe you can say, yeah, all right, we'll send him. He was, he was, he was awful, but... Do just, I deserve the same amount of punishment yeah. as Hitler? Somebody who simply... Probably not. Somebody who simply questions, here you have a... a God who doesn't reveal his existence unambiguously, yep. okay, and yet he will send people into this eternal punishment simply for questioning his existence. Yeah. Okay, and that, I, I think, uh, has some serious moral problems about well, it. Then what, what, do you believe that Hitler was a bad man? Well, sure I do. Of course. I well, mean, why was he bad? And you, I mean, why was Hitler bad? Because he, he, did, he killed six million Jews and... Because he hurt significantly more people than he ever helped. Yeah, I mean, he hurt a lot of people. It's very obvious what Adolf Hitler did, so and I think... He, if he murdered 9 million but helped uh, 10 million, would he be a good man? Nope, not at all. Because chances mean, are he didn't help those 10 million yeah. nearly as much as he hurt the 9. Somebody inclined to yeah. hurt 9 million isn't going to be inclined to help 10, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's very obvious if, you know, what sort of person he was. He was a power-mad dictator who was... Who, as the earlier caller gave an, uh, an example of, he's the kind of guy who set himself apart from human society and said, I'm better, I'm more entitled. Yeah. And I know I, the way they should work. Yeah, and it, and it all needs to be for my benefit. Yeah. And we see what happened. Millions of people died, and he certainly didn't come to a happy fate himself. Yeah. So, again, well, this is all observable as to what happened. Well, basing morality on um, weighing good versus bad outcome, isn't that begging the question of, well, then why is it necessarily good to help more people than it is to hurt people? Someone could say that it's good to hurt people and bad to help people. Until you, until you actually saw that in action and saw that it didn't work. Okay. Again, it has yeah. to do with applied knowledge and observable facts. If you want to say, if you, if you want to start with the premise, hmm, I think it's a good, I think it's good for people to hurt them, and then you go out and you test that theory by hurting someone and, and seeing that, you. and seeing that in fact they're really hurt by being hurt, then you can say, ah, 
that theory doesn't really hold water, I guess. So well, if it helps you. Like, and, and how would it help? Again, then you would be what the kind of person that we in society refer to as a criminal, and you would be apart from human culture as a whole. I mean, the people who go out and say, it helps me to hurt people, and that's all I care about, those are the people that we call criminals, and we take their freedom away, Basically, and they go off in jail. So not bad, they're just a minority? Or? No, they're, no, they're actually bad, because people look at them, and I look at them and say, gee, I don't want to get hurt. I want to be able to you know, go around my life today and not, you know, not have to constantly be on edge because somebody might kill me, shoot me, take my stuff, whatever. Yeah. And look, so I'll give I just you, say, look, look that's no. bad. Uh, I'll give you one more, and then we've got to go on to the next caller, which is, um, I mean, can you, what, under what conditions would it be helpful, for example, to you to hurt someone? Uh huh. Uh, it would be good for me to kill you and eat you. And and then where would you? Where did Hannibal Lecter end up in those movies? He ended up in jail because there he, you go. he was bad, but he thought he was good. Well, it doesn't matter what he thought. The fact is that society disagreed. There so, you go. So morality is basically society's opinion. Mor okay, I'll I'll try to use words of one syllable this time, so it's like, <laughs> like no offense, man, but I just don't understand why this is so hard for guys for guys like you to figure out. It's all based upon observed facts, okay? You can see the results of actions having consequences. You, you do an action, you see the consequence. If it's helpful, then that's a good thing. If it's hurtful, then that's a bad thing. It's not rocket science. We appreciate your call, but we're running on our time. We need to get to the next guy, okay? okay? So thanks very much. Thanks. Mm, okay. All right. Uh, who's next, please? Rob is on one. And again, I don't want to be rude to callers, but I mean, it. it you, they're taking a very simple subject yeah. and making it more complicated than it needs to be. Yeah. Really than it needs to be. That's all it is to it. Uh, Rob is on line one. Let's see. Uh, Rob? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Do you want to chime in on this? Yeah, actually, I, I kind of uh, somewhat got the, the, the point the other caller was trying to make, mm -hmm. but I have my own question, so we'll just ignore him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Feel free. But, um, yeah. Uh, my comment was uh, uh, God as society just yeah. defines it um, is supposedly supposed to be perfect, and humanity, uh, again defined by the same society, is supposed to be imperfect. And as a creation of something that is perfect, mathematically, I've you know just two plus two is four. So how can something imperfect arise out of something that's perfect? I think that's. Well, that's, oh, that's imperfect math. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a relevant yeah. point, and a great many uh, skeptics and, and atheists have, have have made it before. That how can a perfect being uh, create an imperfect creation? Yes. I mean, in in, in point of fact, uh, I don't, he could not. Uh, so, um, but, so uh, good good point. <laughs> a couple, couple of questions for uh, for atheism in general. Um, sure. Is uh, are there more uh, males and females in this movement? Well, we hope not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, There's um, an interesting thing about that. That's probably the best point you guys have made, at least that we hope not. <laughs> <laughs> There's an interesting point about that. Uh, most of the groups that I've usually heard of usually have more men than women, but they've usually been started by women ah. for some mm -hmm. strange reason. It's usually women that start them, but well, men who group? end up saying, well, hey, that's a cool idea. Well, but what about our group? It was started by... Um, Wasn't it Ray Blevins Kellen? and Kellen? and? Kellen whom I didn't know, and, uh, right, well, anyway. Okay, yeah. I can't remember, but. Uh, we know. had one of our, uh, Laura, who's one of our members, was on the show about a year or so ago, and talked about this, and I think that, uh, um, because there was an article in Skeptic Magazine some time back where uh, this one regular columnist they have, who's a woman, says that she goes to a lot of these skeptics conferences and scientific symposiums around the country, and she says it's uh, the one thing that's unusual about these things as opposed to anywhere else she goes is that she never sees a line at the ladies' room. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and so she was talking about, you know, bemoaning that there, that there do seem to be a dis disproportionately fewer number of women who are, who are skeptics and unbelievers in general than there are men. Yeah. And conversely, uh, when you, uh, you know, tune, turn on Oprah and, and she's got some psychic yeah. on, and the audience is just packed to the rafters with women, yeah. mainly. And so I was wondering if I was asking Laura if there, if she thought that there were some inclination in women in general to be more attracted to paranormal or religious 
or superstitious beliefs as opposed to skepticism and rationalism and the scientific method and what have you. And she didn't necessarily agree with that, but uh, she said something along the lines of that women have a lot to worry about in culture in general, and there's yeah. more would probably be the stigma that might get attached to a woman who is an, who is yeah. openly uh, openly atheist, as opposed to not, uh, could end up being stronger than it yeah. would be against a man. You know, because women are thought of, I guess, in more in in in, in more moralistic terms. Generally speaking, like uh, women are, are thought of as mothers and teachers yeah. and and uh, supposed to be nurturers, I guess, and it might reflect more negatively upon a woman's character. Like if you said, oh, a woman doesn't believe in God, then people might think that she, like, unfit mother yeah. or not yeah. good to, you know, it'd be just like, you know, some, you know, the, they might react the same way if, you know, saying, oh, well, she's a, are you still there? Did we lose you? Uh, we, there? May, we may have lost our caller. Hello? We can You're hear there. you. Okay. Hello. Is this still, uh... Can you hear us? Uh, Hi. Yeah, I can hear you. Barely. Okay. So, so that's the, so I hope you, uh, Answered your question there. Yep. Uh, there. Yeah. Um, and uh, one last thing. Um, are, do you actively say I do not believe in God, or do you say that I don't think there is a God? I say I don't believe in God. So uh, strong atheism. Well, um, no. strong atheism is usually that the idea that there is no God. Be versus I don't believe that there is, which yeah. is. Um, I, I usually I usually d take the weak atheist position generally because it's it's adequate to defend atheism. Um, all that I ever claim that I'm saying as an atheist is I don't believe in God, and when I say that, I am reacting to definitions of God that I hear from people who are have a specific religious belief, and they define their God to me in a particular way. And if that definition is either logically inconsistent or just doesn't make sense or can't, there's no way to test it or what have you, then I could say, huh, well, I'm, I just don't believe in that. But it's like the guy, what was Carl Sagan's great example, the dragon in my garage. <laughs> you know, some guy comes to you and says, I have a dragon in my garage. So you go back to his house and you look in his dragon, you don't see anything. And he says, well, you know, well, he's an invisible dragon, you can't see him. So you go, hmm, well, um... I know, why don't we get some spray paint and spray, and then, yeah. and, and then the guy says, well, no, um, yeah. you know, my dragon has this special scaly yeah. hide that resists uh, you know, no. paint <laughs> sticking to it. So again, so, so okay, well, I know, I know what we'll do. We'll sprinkle flour on the floor, and see we'll see his footprints, and the guy says, well, no, see, you can't do that because my dragon levitates all the time. And so any <laughs> test that you can possibly think of to determine the existence of the dragon, the guy who is saying he has a dragon has got some great out that he can always throw in your path and that will prevent you from doing any kind of test. And usually what we get with God or gods are these strange kind of definitions that end up doing that, where there's no real way to determine anything concrete or intelligible. And, and instead we end up just getting these vague definitions like, oh, well, he's all loving and he's this and he's yeah. that. And, he's, yeah. he can, and there's really nothing that you can put your finger on. So consequently, I haven't really heard of a substantial definition of God that I can say, well, yeah, okay, I can get behind yeah. that. So I, say, I don't believe. Could somebody tomorrow could present me with ironclad evidence that I would have to, uh, I mean, I'm always open to anything, any claim that is supported by strong evidence. Yeah. But, um, so, uh, Ashley, did you have? No, that pretty much covers it. Oh, all right. <laughs> See, I'm so good at that. Gonna, so, I mean, again. Have you guys ever read a book uh, called uh, Conversations with God? Mm, Jim, no, no. no it I'm, sounds I'm, vaguely familiar. But. Yeah, it's one of these. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so, about it. Conversations with God with uh, by uh, Neil Donald Walsh. Okay, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Those and, and all those Chicken Soup for the Soul books. It's it's <laughs> the, those. Uh, I, I say I don't know. That might not be the same kind of book, but uh, but I am familiar with the title. All right, so. great time to you. Hey, we okay. appreciate your call. You Thanks take care. Bye. All right, uh, Amanda is online too. Let's see what she has to. Uh, it's our Amanda. Hello. Hi guys. Hey. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm listening to you talking about good and evil. All right. And one of the best books on the subject I ever read was a book intended for kids mm -hmm. by Dan Barker mm -hmm. called oh. Maybe Right, Maybe Wrong. Okay. Okay. Because the question of good and evil is ultimately, for us, the practical side, what are you going to do? One of the callers asked about a parent and a child, a mother and a kid, who kill the the abusive father? Not even abusive. He was rich and they want his money. Oh, well, they wanted his money. Yeah. yeah. Well, the way Dan Barker answers this is that we should live our lives not by rules, but by principles. A principle is 
like a rule in that you're supposed to follow it or you choose to follow it, but where they're different is that a rule is something you're supposed to follow all the time, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And at best, you have a priority of rules. Like, follow this rule if it doesn't conflict with this rule above it. Mm -hmm. Principles are similar. You are supposed to follow them. But it's acceptable to break a principle for the sake of a principle that is more important at the time, more right at the time. And when I say right, I agree with your definition that what makes it right is what are its implications for all of humanity, and not just what are its implications for me. Mm -hmm. There's no rule so good, but that I cannot think of a situation in which it would be evil to follow it. I mean, there's a, a famous story of the man who steals the loaf of bread because he's hungry. Les Miserables. Yeah, and yeah, he gets yeah. chased all over. Yeah. Was his theft right or wrong? I would say it was what he had to do to survive. It did not hurt people that badly, society-wide. So I would judge, if I had to say a yes or no, I would say he was right to do it. Well, th here's an interesting point. Um, there's a, I, I forget, this was some years ago. I don't know if it's in Scientific American or what magazine. But there are... Uh, it, uh, this, this also ties into the other subject that was brought up, which is the gender divide. Um, and uh, if you're talking about implications and ramifications of actions, uh, a group of like male students and, and female students were given the same question, uh, sort of a moral quandary, and I guess just to determine. And uh, the question was, a man's wife is dying of some illness and he's broke, and he's out of work, and he has no money. So is, would it be right for him to steal the medicine needed for her to get well? Now, pretty much across the board, all of the men immediately just said, said yes, it would, it would be acceptable for him to do this. Uh, women, on the other hand, had a little bit of a different take on it, because they thought more in terms of, okay, well, I can see that it might be necessary for him to steal the medicine if he cannot pay for it. However, what if in the process of stealing it, he gets caught, he goes to jail, his wife is still sick, has no medicine. So there are a lot of different ways. Potential. Yeah, and so women tended to think about that consequence in addition to, yeah. you know, um, so men, I guess, are more attracted to immediate results, whereas women might think, oh, but wait, and, yeah. uh, but I don't know. Fire I mean, good. <laughs> <laughs> that I've talked to over my lifetime have never heard of the concept of principles and having to apply them given the situation. They tend mm -hmm. to function as if they knew this intuitively, but mm -hmm. they've never sat back and actually put a name to it and decided whether or not this was a good idea to live your life by principles. Yeah. And now, what about, uh, how, how would you respond to that example that I just gave? What would, be, would I respond? Yeah, what would be your answer to that? I don't know. Okay. You're not well, sure? I'm, I'm real yeah. big on I don't know. Okay. In, in well, okay, well, let's, to let's say you have to make a decision. Let's say like, okay, a woman's going to die tonight if she doesn't get her medication. Well, when that situation comes up, then I'll decide. Ah, come on, I'll come oh. on, no, Amanda, we want to pin you down. on. <laughs> like if a man points a gun at me, would I lie? No. But until that actually happens, I don't even have enough knowledge yeah. of myself. Well, that's true, but I mean, right like, but, but, yeah, but, well, but, I, could, I could say what I would want to, what, what kind of a person Sure, I that's all, we're, we're, yeah, I mean, I in a general... right off the bat... The, the theft should take place. It's okay. saving a life. Right. The consequences of being sent to jail would be worth it to me. I would go to jail for mm -hmm. my spouse, for my spouse mm -hmm. to survive. That's not... See, there I'm laying so, the see so now there. you're applying the principle... I'm applying the principle of mm -hmm. me trying to stay free, the principle of, mm -hmm. you know, survival for somebody I love, mm -hmm. and how much damage is done to the society. Make it a mm -hmm. different question. What if my theft of this medicine dooms somebody I don't know? Now, Who would have gotten that medicine yeah. if had you not stolen it for your spouse? Right. Yeah, see, there's another. But see, right. the question of, of yes or no, mm -hmm. you have to push the idea that there's an I don't know sometimes, and that's yeah. acceptable. Yeah. Whether there's a God or not, if you say I don't know, the definition of an atheist is somebody who does not commit to belief in God, mm -hmm. all those people who would like to call themselves agnostics, relax, get used to it, you're an atheist too. <laughs> and most oh. atheists mm -hmm. that I know 
are also agnostics. Sure, yeah. We don't believe there's no God. We just haven't had it proven to us adequately. Mm -hmm. I mean, your debates on the definitions of what a God could be like or should be like, given a religion, is kind of a waste of time, in my opinion. It's like debating whether or not Luke Skywalker, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> was was right to do what he did. It's sure. a fictional character. It's not a real person. Right. Bring me evidence that this mm -hmm. is a real person first. Right. But again, definition for God changes. Somebody says, Charles Darwin was my God. I'm a theist. No. Well, so. <laughs> no, well, wait a minute now. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. You, you want to get away from that. There is a general consensus yeah. on what a god is supposed to be. Like if this table was my... Okay, yeah. Okay, I think the general consensus on what a god is supposed yeah, to be... Yeah, some supernatural being. ...at its very root, somebody who is exempt from morality, somebody who is exempt from ethics. Hmm. Or somebody... Who, yeah, because they're, they're above us. They're whether an authority they're over so us. Whether powerful or whether mm -hmm. because they own us. Mm -hmm. And this is silly. If a space alien created my species mm -hmm. and told me, now you will do what I want because I'm saying what's right and wrong, I would say, very likely, screw you. Yeah. I mean, if, <laughs> yeah, that's right. if aliens yeah. landed and they were vastly superior to us in every single way, shape, or form, their technology, their sense of ethics, their morality, if they could teleport themselves, if they were telepathic, could read minds. Still doesn't all mean these, we should worship them. Yeah. Should, would it be appropriate for us to worship them? Just because they're that much more, they they are to our appearance all powerful, Gods. right? Um, but those are all good points. And I th and and well, but getting back to uh, the the point that uh, you just made was that the what I was trying to uh, make clear was that you know again when a, a theist comes to me and says you know I think you should believe in my God, well it is up to them to define that being. Now if they give me a definition that simply makes no sense. I'm justified in saying, well, I don't believe you. And to me, that's what atheism means. Uh, Mandy, there? Yeah. Okay. Um, but you're right. If, if you wanted to, discussing the problem of evil and, and, and various philosophical arguments, um, in, in, in the purest sense, you're right. It would be most appropriate, I think, first to say, well, whoa, wait a second. Let's, let's, let's square away whether or not this being exists at all first mm -hmm. before we then begin to talk about God's moral responsibility, why he doesn't stop you know, terrorists from doing what they do, and what have you. Yes, I mean, in, in, in the general sense, it is you know, discussions about a being whose existence we haven't even proved yet uh, is an act of irrelevance. However, um, what actually has been working out by criticizing Strobel's book and a lot of uh, and through uh, understanding and trying to make sense of the questions that we've been getting on this show from our Christian callers um, they they think that <clears throat> by refuting some of these arguments like pro like the problem of evil yeah. or the euthyphro dilemma or what have you that these will constitute proofs of their God and so we have to make it understood why it doesn't really mm -hmm. so that's uh, that's that so that is why these Philosophical criti criticisms, I think, are worthy of discussion. Oh, I'd like to get more women in on the discussion. I think that we, we are losing 50% of our nation's brain power by mm -hmm. not yeah. allowing women to speak on this. And I don't think that it's ostracism that women are afraid of. I think it is... Uh, uh, it's, it's not just being looked at funny when you're at the grocery store mm -hmm. or having an atheist T-shirt. It is you will potentially lose contact with rel relatives Mm -hmm. You will potentially yeah. lose relationships with friends when you are out as an atheist. Mm -hmm. And for a woman who makes, statistically women make much less money than men do, that can be disastrous. Women, a lot sure. of women can't afford to be openly atheists. Yeah, sure, sure. The other, other thing that I think that's common, that I, speaking of a female, I think is very common, is I have a feeling that the world is all right. I have a feeling that things are going to come out. I even have a feeling that somebody's watching over me. And I don't think it's supernatural. I think that it's a normal part of being a healthy, well-adjusted human being to have a sense that, you know, we're not going to have the world end next week. I think this is more common in women than it is in men. I think that women have a sense of something that they were told from a very early age to call faith. Well, hmm. I was afraid when I became an atheist that if I stepped away from the belief that I would lose that feeling. You see it all the time in movies of the, the drunken ex-preacher who's so broken up because his life is empty. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I'm just fine. I stopped, 
believing in the great man in the sky, <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and it wasn't replaced with a terrible nihilistic bleakness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's another reason I think that most women tend to be theists. Two yeah. reasons. Uh-huh. You can't afford to be out, mm-hmm. and you tend to have an intuitive sense, like you feel like there is a God, Yeah, but I'm it's just a feeling that you were told to call God. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good point. I mean, I have you know, a lot of another common question that Christians you know, ask atheists is, "Boy, I mean, you don't believe in God? Just, doesn't that make your life this horrible, uh, never-ending uh, uh, exercise shell? in emptiness and misery and, and <laughs> woe and pointlessness?" It's like, well, no, not really. Did and you hear it, on the news last night? Hmm. Um, some guys trapped in a collapse. The miners. The miners they came out, and the uh-huh. first thing out of one of their mouths was, "Thank God," and I wanted to say, "Yes." If there's this fictional being, thank you for not punishing me more horribly than you already have. Yeah. 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 Or, yeah, or, so, or, uh, I think that next time I get a paper cut, I'm mm-hmm. going to say, thank you, invisible, fictitious being, for not cutting my finger off. And when mm-hmm. I stub my toe, I'm going to say, thank you for not having a great <laughs> earthquake open up underneath me and swallow me up. <laughs> that is no bounds, no foul, so keeper of the freaking universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think if I were one of the actual rescue guys that, that uh, hauled his ass up, I would have been, uh, well, uh, I appreciate that, but actually my name's Phil. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, you know, <laughs> hey, you know, that's, religious people will say that, that's the thing they say. And, and of course, we're all, we're all happy that all of those miners were rescued, of course. Yeah. We're, we're, we're overjoyed at uh, the human resourcefulness that made that happen. But yeah. thanks, Amanda, we got four minutes and we got one more caller to take. You take care. Take thanks, care, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, Darren? Hey, You've been I, holding for a really long time, and we appreciate sorry it. Sorry about that. Right. Um, first of all, see, I, I think it's kind of for, uh, ignorant for, um, for us to be arguing about a being uh, who is omniscient, being non-omniscient ourselves, who we do not completely know the difference between good and evil, arguing about a being who does know the difference between good and evil. If, you, know, for, you know, for your sake, I'll say it's theoretical. I wondered what, what gives us the right to argue about this being and what he does in the world if it's evil, if it's evil or good. If, if we don't, if we cannot completely know the difference because we are not omniscient. Okay. Well, first off, um, no one's omniscient on this earth, right? I'm sure you'd agree with that. Right. Omniscience is not so. Omniscience cannot possibly be the criterion for making an informed decision about information you get on a certain subject. We have to work with the knowledge that we do have. Now, <clears throat> the reason I think it's relevant to talk about, okay, is because from our standpoint, there's a big group of people called Christians who are trying to tell us that we have to believe this stuff, we have to worship this being, these are this being's properties, and we'll go to a very, very bad place uh, if we don't believe in this being. So, I think that gives us the right to say, well, now wait a minute, and examine the belief system that we're being told to adopt, and if we have criticisms about it, then we're going to voice those criticisms, and to say, well, you can't make that criticism because you're not omniscient, is immaterial. Just, I mean, it's no more valid than to say, oh, well, you can't tell me that my favorite rock band sucks because you're not omniscient and you haven't heard every rock band in the world, so how can you say that the one I like is bad? You don't make decisions based on those criteria. You make decisions based upon the information and the knowledge you do have and the knowledge that you're being given at the time. Yeah. You know. If you don't question God, you're not acting responsibly yeah. or moral. You and have to question where your rules are coming from. If and you don't, you're not being <clears throat> responsible. And if omniscience were the criteria, if you, you could also say, since you're not omniscient, you have no more, re- no more reason than to go ahead and believe and worship than you would to disbelieve and critique. If, if omniscience were the guide and saying, well, you cannot critique this God, this being, because you, don't, you can't possibly know everything about him, you're not omniscient, it would, make, it would be just as valid to say, well, you don't really have a solid basis to worship him and believe in him, since you're not omniscient and you don't know everything that there is to know about him. Well, don't you believe that if there was a being outside the world who was omniscient and did know everything, that he would have a very different idea than me or you or someone in the Taliban of what is you know, right or wrong? Uh, well, I can't say that because I don't know how an omniscient being off the top of would have ideas about things. I would think that since Christianity, from a Christian standpoint, says that God made us in his image, then if I'm to use the Christian definition and the Christian ideas, I would have to s- then conclude that my ideas of what might make right or what might make wrong would be similar to his. To his. Because if, if he made me in his image, then my ideas of things ought to be very, very much like his ideas of things. Anyway, listen, why don't you call us back next week? We're here at 4.30 because we're into our last minute, okay? Thanks, Darren.
All right. Thanks for watching. Thank you to our great crew and our viewers at all times. Uh, we'll be back here 4.30 next Sunday. We may have some very interesting uh, things to talk about the lecture, the NLP yes. lecture that yes. we get. Um, visit our website, atheist-community.org. Don't forget to listen to the nonprofit Saturday afternoon, too, at atheistnetwork.com. Uh, what am I leaving out in 10 seconds? Help me, Ashley. Oh, bagel no. shop. Bagel shop, yes. All atheists and unbelievers are welcome to our bagel shop meeting Sunday morning. Christians, we, we don't, don't hate, hate you. you. We, we just, just think, think you're wrong. wrong. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.